Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, has long been used to evaluate and diagnose conditions relating to an aging brain. But is quantitative MRI the next frontier in evaluating tissue pathology? Dr. Richard Spencer from the National Institute of Health is here to discuss. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk about my work. Absolutely. Okay, let's get right into your work. Can you explain your area of expertise and why you would be at a physics conference? Well, I, my PhD is in medical physics, and I am also a physician. So this kind of work brings together both of those aspects of my interests and background. And a physics meeting is a natural place to learn some of the more cutting edge techniques as well as to discuss some of this work to interested physicists because there is a big physics component to it. All right, let's talk about that. So the quantitative MRI and your research into that, you've brought some visuals for us today. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about your work and your research? Well, first of all, I just want to mention quantitative MRI is a, is a recent, um, it has been coined recently to describe what we do to quantify our MR results, but really it's been an effort since the beginning of MRI to produce quantitative results. It's just that now it's more and more possible with advanced techniques, both in instrumentation and analysis. And I guess I should ask you to kind of differentiate quantitative MRI versus our traditional MRI that we're used to. Yeah, so what we're, what we're trying to do is quantify the amount of something in the brain, and that something is myelin. So qualitative MRI would produce an image, say a T2-weighted image, that shows where the, where the deficits are, and they may show generalized inflammation. But you can't look at that and say, well, it's twice as bright, so there's half as much stuff there. Or it's, the signal's degraded by a certain amount, so that therefore we know that there's that amount less of myelin. Quantitative MRI in this setting, and what we're trying to do is really be able to say, well, we have a certain signal loss that's, say, 50% signal loss, and that actually is to translate into a 50% loss in myelin, okay. or 30% signal loss, 30% loss in myelin. I do want to mention, though, that this is not a new idea from my group. This was pioneered by Alex McKay at the University of British Columbia in the 1990s, and he's continued to do outstanding work in this area uh, and now many, many other groups are involved in that kind of research. Okay, so now can we get to one of your slides and explain what we're looking at here on the screen? Sure, roughly this, is a, this shows the structure of a nerve and an axon in the myelin sheath. So on the left you see the, the actual uh, body of the nerve cell and w with its dendrites and various, and its nucleus, other, uh, a lot of other complex structures in there. But then there's a protuberance or a fiber that comes off that called an axon. And many nerves, not all, but many nerves are myelinated, meaning that there's this myelin sheath, which is, uh, which is shown here in yellow. Myelin is a fatty sheath that forms around the nerve fibers called axons. And it really has two functions. One function is to potentiate electrical transmission along the axon. In other words, make it, it helps create accurate transmission. It also forms a protective shell around the axon, so it saves it from degradation. When that myelin sheath is degraded, what happens is the nerve transmission is interrupted or doesn't go as efficiently or as quickly, and in later cases or at later stages, the axon itself and the nerve itself suffer damage that can be irreparable. What we're seeing here is a side view of the myelin. So the myelin is laid down in, not, not quite concentric, but successive uh, layers. And these are fatty layers, and in that layer, importantly for our work, there are water molecules, and these water molecules inside these fatty layers are much more restricted in motion than, mo than water molecules that are outside of the fatty layer. So our studies make use of the fact that the water is motionally restricted within that sheath. So what are the challenges in trying to measure myelin? It doesn't have its own intrinsic signal. We see myelin through seeing water. So what a lot of people don't realize is that all of MRI, or I should say 99.5% of MRI, is based on mapping water, mm -hmm. it's just water. So no matter what tissue we're looking at, we're always looking at the water in that tissue. In the case of myelin, we look at the water inside these sheaths. And so your solution to? So our solution to this is to look at the full signal. The MRI device is just it generates a certain kind of electrical signal. And one of those kinds of signals can look like a decaying exponential, for example, which is a curve that looks like this. Only instead of this curve emanating from one type of water molecule, there can be two or even three different components inside that, inside that decay curve. And our challenge is to dissect those from each other so that we can specify which part is from myelin, which part is from 
non-myelin water. Okay, let's get to another visual now because you've got an equation that you're using to try to do this research. Can you explain what we're seeing now? Yeah, this is one of our earlier and, and rather successful attempts at working on this problem where we ultimately want the left-hand side. We, we have a brain image. You take the brain image with the scanner mm -hmm. in a certain way to give you a certain kind of curve or a certain kind of steady state signal. And what we want is these parameters shown on the left. They can be magnetization transfer, T1 row, T1, T2, diffusion characteristics. So we want to drive these parameters given the data. That's called an inverse problem, and it can be very difficult to solve. So one way to convert that to a so-called forward problem where you take the system and then decide or figure out what kind of signal it will have, is to, that's the so-called forward problem, is uh, to use Bayes' theorem. So Bayes' theorem, illustrated here, tells you how to take a hard inverse problem and turn it into an easier forward problem. Again, the inverse problem is given the data, how do you get parameters? The forward problem is given parameters, how do you get the data? That's easy to do. So this is Bayes' theorem explaining the relationship between the hard inverse problem and the easier forward problem. There's another term here which involves prior knowledge or assumptions about the system under study. And so can you give us an example of some of the results that you found using this, this process? Well, we're looking at, in this case, this is a study of, uh, of subjects uh, in different categories. These are young, unimpaired on the left, older, unimpaired, cognitively unimpaired subjects, on, second from the left, mild cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, and vascular dementia. So these are all myelin water fraction maps. So again, myelin water fraction coined by Alex McKay uh, in the 90s is a quantitative way to look at the amount of myelin in a way that really is proportional to the signal that we see. So uh, in the, um, the, the young unimpaired is sort of the standard. That's what we would all like to see. Uh, older, you can see there's a loss of myelin with a much less bright yellow coloration throughout. Mild cognitive impairment, which is a condition that can be viewed as a, either a stable condition of impaired thought or a precursor to things like Alzheimer's disease, but we begin to see loss of, focal loss of myelin, uh, that where you see these more brightly colored regions being replaced by some of the darker blue. In Alzheimer's, that progresses to an even greater extent, and then vascular dementia has uh, r patterns very closely related to Alzheimer's. And this work was done in conjunction with my colleague, Mustafa Burhara, at the NIA. How promising are these results to you? Well, I think that these are very promising. These are still early in the sense that although we've used this method quite a bit, we're still very actively developing additional advanced methods. And that's the work that I'll be primarily presenting here tomorrow in my, in my talk, where we're talking about, we're, we're moving beyond just the Bayesian method into other more sophisticated techniques in solution of inverse problems, really more in the area of applied mathematics. Do you think quantitative MRI will eventually become the gold standard when it comes to treating brain health? I think so, and I think in the world of myelin, it's especially exciting because for the first time, there are actually therapies on the horizon to actually treat demyelinating disease. I should mention that myelin loss occurs throughout life, but there's intrinsic body processes that will regenerate the myelin. They require a lot of cellular energy, though, so, they're, so they can't always keep up. And when that falls into disarray and the balance between, between repair of myelin and degradation of myelin goes the wrong way, then you can end up with clinical disease. But I think these methods are going to be even more important as therapies are developed and uh, patients have to be followed, therapies have to be titrated and adjusted to their clinical response as well as to their imaging response. So I'm very excited about the possibilities for this kind of work. Well, we're very excited that you're here and that you're going to be presenting, and we certainly appreciate all of your research and for your time today. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much.